Hello, everyone. Hi, Hello. Chris. Hi, yeah. How's things? I hope things are going good. You're all keeping well and um, happy after all these celebrations of the new year. Um, welcome to another episode of Awakening Happiness, where we share stories and our discoveries as we awaken our happiness. If you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, please take a minute to do that. And today, I hope you find this topic really interesting. Um, I certainly have been hearing a lot about this story from Chris. No story, really. It's a book. We're going to be talking about a book today. One of Chris's favorites, I would say that's Chris's Bible <laughs> these days. <laughs> and we're going to find out why he is so, so mesmerized. I don't know if that's the right word, but why he keeps talking about this book all the time so chris what's the significance of this book and which book is it well we'll come on to which book it is in a minute because as the story unfolds it kind of enters into the frame so um yeah but i've seen a book a while back like five years ago i guess or four years ago called miracle mornings Mir miracle miracle morning now lots and lots of people will have heard of this book and it's basically um it basically says that during your day you should set up a routine which involves uh a number of things you know like uh, reading uh visualizations um you know, meditation yeah but six things about six things and you don't have to do the you know the, the book is not saying you've got to do this it's saying this is a technique that the author used in order to become uh, successful, whatever that means to you. Um, and so I started, I started doing this um, every day. Um, and, you know, it, it, that was years ago, I'm still doing it. So it, it's, it's kind of something I've adopted. Now, what happened is during the process of that obviously you read 10 minutes a day and and although it doesn't sound very much you do actually wade your way through a number of books um one of the books i i i read what was the book we what, what did we say um, was the, un, the untethered soul yeah mm -hmm. I, I got you now people started to one person in particular but people started to realize that i was reading and it's just like sending me books funny enough um and uh <laughs> I, I then came. I then got sent this book, and that that I get a little bit of name check. It was Nikki Pepper that was sending me these books, and um, and basically then she sent me one book. It was I don't know if it was Christmas time or whatever, but it was this book, Three Pillars of Zen. Now that cover is detached. It looks very book. thin. This book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's the rest of it. Yeah, like, because I've been reading it so much, the book's come apart now, right? So <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, and I'm not, I'm not preaching about this book. What I'm doing it because the, this book is and Zen in particular. Zen, it's Zen Buddhism basically, and uh, it, it's a Japanese uh, sort of change to buddhism so it's a, it's gone off on a on a path of its own kind of thing but obviously it started with buddhism and it's not detached itself entirely it's just it, it it's just got a, a slightly different basic ethos kind of thing and um i read it mm -hmm. uh this book um and what what i like about buddhism in maybe general, maybe we leave this a little bit for for wait a minute for this till we've um covered a little other thing which is okay, a story well, I, so well, I'll, I'll take your, yeah. your time <laughs> <on this. laughs> so i wanted to start with a story so you have a bit of a visual as well as um um, narrative. um symbolic and metaphorical understanding of of what um 
Zen Buddhism is. And also because this story is from the book. Yep. And it comes with some beautiful, very old Japanese pictures. Uh, that actually, I know, I, when I was looking into this, the history of them is a little bizarre and unsure, being uncertain because they're so old. And there are different variations of these pictures as well. But the ones that we're going to be showing you today are from the book. From the 12th century. And, the 12th century. So. Yeah. So let me share my screen. The reason I'm on my computer today is because I want to show you this presentation, which I created yesterday with a lot of love for this occasion. <laughs> so I'm starting to share my screen. And you will see... <clears throat> Um, the story that we're going to tell is the story of the 10 Oxford in pictures. And Chris might be able to help me along here because he's studied this more often. Um, more, no more often, more in depth. Well, every day, so that's often. <laughs> um, um, not, not these pictures every day, but anyway. Not the pictures, but the whole the whole idea about this um, this story, as I learned from him, was to for people to identify whereabouts on their journey to um, enlightenment they are, and the ox in this case um, <clears throat> is like the metaphor for one's true nature. Is that right, Chris? Yeah, well, if you put a put a mind, as they call it, or Dharma mind, which is more what they use in India. So the whole idea of it, I think, is that this this is your mind that we're talking about, which is represented by the ox. And the reason it's represented by the ox is because it's a sacred animal in India, where it all began. And of course, they're using it as a sacred representation mm -hmm. of your mind. Okay, so let's see. The first picture. The story begins with the searching for the ox which is searching for your mind <laughs> which is searching for your true for your nature. mind for your true nature so in the pastures of the world the um, i endlessly push aside, aside the tall grasses in search for the bull well it's a bull or it's an ox it's kind of the same kind of animal <laughs> so there's this ox herd um, looking for the bull for the ox and he can't find it and, and and you can read these verses they're quite um quite beautiful the way they are i'm not going to read through them i'm just going to quickly go through the meaning of it with chris's help so this first one is where where people are kind of tired of what chris well they got to get to a stage where they're they, they must they're believing there's a bit more to life they're not quite there's more there's more to life than where they are so generally they've got through the stages of, of uh, greed and, or they, they might be still in it but they're still in the greed and 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 looking for worldly gains and then and they've come to this realization really that must be a bit that i'm a bit fed up with this there must be some there must be something mm -hmm. else so it's like and chasing then, chasing something but then actually it's an illusion Is yeah they don't, they, don't, they don't know what they're looking for really but they're just they're, they're, they've got it they're, they're basically thinking this there must be more to life than this really. mm -hmm. and that, and or someone might have died and they're questioning now what happens when you die and you know like and there's a bit of anxiety around this whole you know the whole time in, <laughs> time's running out type of thing. <laughs> yeah. And so this is the first uh, picture, and then we'll continue to the second one. So after all this searching, high and low, far and wide, the Oxford has actually seen some footprints. Um, yeah. And these might be... These might be teaching teachings like what well, they call sutras, which are or or things like or or or, or any kind of teaching really. It's like you grab the Bible, but it's not the Bible. You, you basically found something 
which has sparked your interest. And this is this is the footprint because it's leading you off. <laughs> it's like the little carrot that's, yeah, that's yeah. leading you along the or bread the part of... they're, they're laying there. You want to find out a bit more. Yeah. So you want to find out a bit more, and you keep going, you keep going, and oh, now you're seeing the ox somewhere there hiding. And what might this? This is basically a bit of a realization. So you basically something's clicked in the mind and you basically ah ah okay I get that and it's like and what that what this does is it in, infuses you to seek further. So I like this poem part where it says he um so he's found he's seen the bull and now he says here no bull can hide. What artist can draw this massive head, those majestic horns? It's like some some beauty in all of this. So he's found he's found he's seen the ox, but uh, and he's like um, really appreciative and mesmerized to the whole thing. How how amazing the whole thing is. Yeah, I mean, and this is a point. I mean, this is a point where he basically re understood. You've understood that something here. You've seen you've seen it, but you. You haven't grasped it. You haven't really haven't grasped it yet because you've just seen it. And you've seen it, which means basically you now understand, but there's a difference between understanding and knowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're at that stage, right, where you basically grasped it, but it's like we're not there yet. It's a long way to go. So maybe a lot of people might be on this stage in their in their understanding of the world and oh, the vast, the vast looking majority, for answers. You know, the vast majority of people will be here in one way or another, whether it's with Buddhism or whether it's with religion or whatever, it doesn't really matter. I mean, ultimately... Just in their progress, yeah. Just in their progress, it's like there's more going on than they... Than, and, and I mean, it... it and it's yeah. interesting how the picture shows the the back end of the bull, not that massive head with the majestic horns. This yeah. is, I thought that was a bit interesting where the, the picture can't even, because it says it's who, which artist can actually draw that. It's not possible. So they've drawn the back end of the bull. Yeah. <laughs> so that's another stage, yeah. Right. And then we have the next stage where the bull has now been caught. And well, it's, it's it seems exactly. like there is a big, big fight here where the bull doesn't want to be caught, and the, the man, the, the ox herd, needs to enforce um, his will over it, over the bull, and like push and pull and have a whip <laughs> and the, the, the rope and everything. It's like a big battle. <laughs> well, yeah, because you know, to let go of all these things that we've learned and the pleasures of money and buying stuff and everything else, it's got a pretty strong grip on us. And like to basically be able to fight this and realize that life isn't about a new car or a new house or a new this, these are physical possessions that we can't take with us. To kind of get to this realization is a struggle. It's a, it's a massive battle and, and if we, if we just let our mind carry on, it just goes back to what it knows, doesn't it? And it's like this. It'll go back to the sweet grass and the cavorting in the hills, <laughs> and you've lost it again. <laughs> so it, it takes a real a real mind over matter, really, to, to sort of like get, to this, get, get through this. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's what that represents. Okay. And then after this initial battle... There comes the taming of the ox, where yeah, I mean, thou, now there is no need for any of this violence and struggle and enforcing the whip and the rope are not necessary anymore, and they just start walking home. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he's still got to be careful because, you know, like something comes along and gets distracted. Off, it's <laughs> like he's off again, you know, like so. Um, so you've got to keep you've got to keep like this is like 
oh, I've, I, I know this now, so I'm not going to bother going and, and uh, studying anymore because I can't. And then off before you know it, it's all he's, he's off again. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, you, and, you, and all the work that you've done is is kind of just just, just thrown away. Um, but while you keep tending the fields, you keep you keep basically uh, control of things. So yeah, it's uh, it's don't give up. Don't don't feel that after this initial thing you, you you've won the battle here because you haven't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then, oh wow! Look, riding home on the ox. So after the. Well, at this stage, um, the, the ox seems to be walking by himself and the ox herd is just playing his flute and having a, a free ride and he's just completely, completely, um, what do I want to say here, as, as if the ox knows where it needs to go and the ox herd just needs to be nice just let go of the need to control the ox yeah, this absolutely. is my impression of what i'm looking at this picture he's just uh, very peaceful relaxed just playing his music and and the ox just follows the music maybe i don't know well you know like this is where in, in my, in my yeah pretty much on, on there it's like the, there's no need to no need to like control or do anything it's like you kind of got it at this point and it's like you're just going along your journey developing uh, but there's no win or loss no nothing's nothing really affects the ox herder and the and the, and the bull they're just like going in the direction that you need to go yeah. and i like this um the last part of this verse whoever hears this melody will join me yeah so, so it's becoming magnetic it's becoming very attractive to other people who want to yeah because most, most of the time they're charging around aren't they charging around stress anxiety and all this and then there's this guy just sitting on top of his uh <laughs> playing his flute it's like oh i quite like the idea of this piece there's there's peace here yeah and then the up oh, strangely enough now the ox is forgotten and well, the self remains yeah it's like basically at this there's point, no bull anymore <laughs> the, 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 what's happened here is that the bull and the person are one and the same is to their two rep two sides of the same coin and then at this stage there is an understanding that what what was that what what you know, it's like you've no need to even consider this because now it's a known entity. It's imbibed within the person. It's basically. Uh, and that, he is, has abandoned the whip and the ropes. Yeah, because there's no need for them anymore. He's kind of understands that it's. Yeah. And just note this circle here. Um, because now. Both self and the ox are forgotten. <laughs> no yeah. ox anymore, no self anymore. A whip, rope, person and bull all merge in no thing. Yeah, so basically this is quite a development. I mean, this is like way, way in the future. Way ahead. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like where, uh, you know, you basically are one with, are one with the world. One way, you know, you, you really understand that the whole idea of Buddhism at this point. So, you basically, you know, there's no need for any ox house. You know, you've forgotten, you, you, you know, there is a stairs of things say that once you once you realize things at the, the deep level, you know, even yourself disappear. You know, like you're not, you're mm -hmm. not, there's no self anymore, there's just. There's just the, the universe and uh, your essence or your source is just in this physical form, uh, but it comes and goes, you know, and passes, and there's no concern over it. It's just, you know, what it is, you know. 
and I like the idea of um, maybe that's how the whole idea of the circle as a shape being adopted as a the wholeness. It's the uh, the closing of the of the cycle. Um, <clears throat> It's the whole thing and also the no thing. Mm. It's the sacred shape of, of, of unity, uh, the most balanced, harmonious shape. And we use this in, in Neurographica a lot to represent harmony. Well, I can see now where it, where it started in the 12th century, maybe even oh, earlier. These, these, the last three, this is the first of the last three, these were added later to sort of close the loop. Uh, because mm. it, felt that, it was felt that there was still a bit more, and you can liken this to the hero's, the hero's journey. Right, yeah. Like you, you've got to go back and help others upon... Help on, others. Yeah, on this journey, yeah. Um, so there is this return to the origin. I think I've misspelled something there, but that, never mind. Yes. Back to the source. <laughs> Back to the source. Too many steps have been taken, returning to the roots and the source. Better to have been blind and deaf. So he's actually looking back at his, at his uh, confused original first steps, first, first, the first part of the story, first, second, third parts of the, the beginning of the story, and thinking, "What a fool I've been." <laughs> Well, this stage that's, just, that's what I'm believing this means, right? Yeah, there's, there's no, there's no need to think about anything. Um, you know, like grass is green, you know, rivers flow. It's, it's a, you know, it's just very, very, it's very, very simple now. And like, it's understanding mm -hmm. that life is just a continual stage of wax and wane, and that's just how it is. And it's like it's just that level of of understanding really. just, yeah, of peace and no internal struggle of trying to control nothing. your world and the last one is this one is a bit confusing to me but maybe you'll explain a little bit so entering the marketplace with extended oh sorry about my spelling I was late last night and <laughs> so Barefooted and naked of breast. So why does he need to be bare, bare, barefooted? Well, like really, that, there is no need for possessions. Is that what this means? Yeah, it's basically all earthly stuff is irrelevant, really. So basically, mm. whatever comes, comes. Whatever goes, goes. Marketplace means with people. Marketplace, yeah. I was also thinking maybe this is where there's lots of people crowd yeah, like so the world yeah so just where, going, where there's dealings with other people you're exchanging yeah and you engage it, with people in in the olden days when this one was done in japan probably that was the common place where people met uh, yeah it was just in the metaphor city. again yeah in, in the, the city, city mm -hmm. center really basically um it is is just helping people and this is where now before me the dead trees become alive so basically people who were you know like essentially beyond hope <laughs> so his with his style and his approach and his he's he's basically helping them to you know just through these these times and the interesting thing is is that at that stage no one sees him as anything special or he basically because there's no need to show anybody he's any he, yeah he's not anything special his understanding is i'm the same as everybody else there is no absolutely no difference there's no ego or pride in the fact that he's got to this stage because that's a trap you know that's uh mm -hmm. that's self-inflicted delusion again because what it, you know well, there's no difference between anybody uh, and at this stage he's kind of totally got that and he's just just going about his his life living helping others and and so this is what uh, Zen Buddhist does they don't just sit in a monastery all their life although they might spend some time there to become to reach this stage but then they move on and they live their life 
surrounded by people like like normal people normal life um, they, they, well, it, they live they might live in a house like ours it, it depends i think you know like obviously there are people who are there are zen masters who are there in the temples to basically host what we call session what they call sessions which are where where people go to if you like it's like a work not a workshop but like an intensive <laughs> week yeah. where they're completely a immersed, <laughs> yeah completely immersed in this uh, stuff where they try and gain enlightenment which would be like step three or four in these pictures Mm -hmm. They try to get to that point, and then when they, then when it finishes, they continue at home or in their own locality, and yeah, move forward. Um, they may go back and do another session and another. Um, but yeah, so you know, obviously, many thousands might go through uh, the temples. And then they go back into society. So yes, many thousands of people would be there, but the Zen Buddhist masters are kind of almost like a focal central point, and many of those mm -hmm. reside in temples because that's just the place they do their work, really. Yeah. So uh, this this stage here, the last one, would be the stage of uh, them them Buddhist masters, right? Well, if you work at it long enough, you would end up becoming a Buddhist master, but there's there's not every Buddhist master's going to uh -huh. have a temple. So we need another picture <laughs> for that. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Back to the 12th century. <laughs> and ask them, why haven't you included the 13th, the 11th picture? So that was our story. Now let me go back to, where am I, here and um so back to that book how we're going with time well we've we are not too bad so i have a question for you chris you already started telling us about this but how is zen buddhism different and i'm thinking here about different from uh christianity different from any other well i know christianity most but maybe also hinduism or or well, I mean, any other the, religion the thing is there's no like magical component in in buddhism in general it's like it's uh there's no like like in christianity you had jesus and god like it's like it's a mythic mythical in terms of in terms there of are figures yeah mm -hmm. and, and there's something magical whereas in all, all that happened really with Buddha was that he got enlightened and he and he basically went around helping people understand what he learned and how he saw things. So consequently, it's not magical. It's just a, almost like a thinking concept. And there's nobody saying this is how you. This is what this meant. This is what this meant. This is what this meant. What there is is a series of, of potential suggestions. And then you have to do your own thinking. It's a bit like going to university. Like, here's some stuff. Now, yeah, what, now make work sense it of it. Now, yeah, what, make sense what, of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. And and what 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 intrigues me about that is is that's kind of how I've been all my life. It's like I'm not going to follow what you just said. I'm just going to see how I work it out. Because what you've done is you've done this and you've kind of come up with your own idea about it. Like, well, I might come up with a different idea. So I want to. Mm. I don't want. I want to. Don't want to follow your idea. I want to work out what I can. Because I might come up with something that I think is is more suitable to me. Yeah. Me, and I might come up with something which other people might find interesting. So mm -hmm. what I like about this is is that there's no fixed course. You have to find. You have to find your own path with it. It's like and, an adventuring kind of attitude yeah, I, to... I've done that yeah. my whole life. So for me, it wasn't anything any different. It was just, it wasn't like come to, you know, come to church on a, a Sunday and you sit here and you read this and you read that. And this is what you do. This is more like, no, this isn't what you do. These are the practical steps of how you can best put yourself in a position to give yourself the best chance of learning. 
right. or best chance of understanding. So there are things, you know, they have this concept of like a, a house where the precepts are the foundations, and the precepts are like don't kill anybody, treat people well, you know, this kind of. Have you got another? I think we are going on to the next step, which is this. Oh one. yeah. Okay. What so are the three pillars? Yeah. So well, the there's three, three pillars. Yeah, I mean, the three pillars, according to this book, are teaching, practice, and enlightenment. Right, okay, which are, okay, when you learn, when you are learning something new, you have to be taught something, don't you? Because otherwise you won't, it's like, you, you're just not, you're not learning anything about the new thing you want to learn about. So teaching is like the precepts. So what are the precepts? The precepts, and you, you can read the book yourself, but the precepts are basic things, like the Ten Commandments in, in, Christianity, it's almost like don't kill anybody, mm. like treat people with treat people uh, uh, in, in, like be in harmony. Like you want to be treated by them, yeah. Mm -hmm. be, be in harmony with everything around me. Don't you know? I don't steal or you know, look after other people's property. It's basic stuff. There's nothing to. But like, if you are um, keeping the precepts, like, and some people struggle with that. So basically, zazen, which is the next bit is about sitting quietly every day or maybe three times a day sitting quietly and trying to understand your true nature now while you're doing zazen you are not going to break it basically break the precepts are you because you can't steal when you're sitting right? quietly contemplating yeah <laughs> So, so basically, as you contemplate and as you sit there and you do these things, they kind of work together. And you, through this zazen, which is basically, you might call it meditation, but in the early days, you're trying to control the mind because the mind is like it goes everywhere. I don't know whether you've ever sat down and just thought, well, I'm not going to think about anything. Right. Um, yeah, um, I don't think it's about not thinking about anything. No, no, but, but this is a particular type of meditation, mm. which is about not thinking. And, they, and, and basically let's see what comes and then just dispelling it, uh, you know, like just letting it fly by as it were. So it's like a cloud on a windy day, an idea comes and then it just goes again. <laughs> and, and because in that concept is the start, the cloud appears, then, oh, what am I going to do with this cloud? And then there's the ending of the cloud disappears. And actually that is the fundamental law of everything, isn't it? Is that everything has a start a beginning uh, you know like a middle and mm -hmm. then a end. everything i don't you know, it's like you, a birth life and death yeah if you can tell me anything that doesn't comply to that i, I appreciate it tell me yeah you know, give me a give me something which doesn't have that beginning middle and end even a mountain even a even a planet even a it's a constant, we're, we're in a constant flow and flux and yeah, transformation yeah. from one to another. Like energy yeah. is not lost, it just transformed. It's transformed. So basically you have this middle bit, this Zazen, which is, with, and they teach you in this book how you would go about doing that. Like the physical thing, how you sit, you know, do you need a cushion, don't you need a cushion, what if it's cold, you know, like, yeah, it's basic, you know, like this is just basic rudimentary stuff. Mm -hmm. which allows you to be put into a position where you can do this stuff and it's not different you know like it's not big stuff it's like sitting and being quiet there's nothing difficult about that is it well there is actually quite difficult <laughs> like, how do you breathe and you know like how do you have mm -hmm. to have a straight back or you know all this and then eventually through the combination of the precepts and the and the zazen which mm -hmm. this book tells you about and very few books tell you about the importance of zazen zazen is really like the key to it you end up being acquiring wisdom, which is enlightenment, and which is the third, which is the third pillar, if you like, enlightenment. And this book takes you through, through you know, the teaching, the practice, and the, in, you know, the enlightenment. That, uh, and the mm -hmm. light, those pictures, by the way, were at the last stage of this book. It, it's not at the start; it's at the end because they're explaining how it came about and all this stuff. But they're not getting too bogged down in it, like a lot of other books on. Zen will give you all the reasons why it happened and the loads of information about the teachers and their lives. It's like, well, how relevant is that really? Yeah, so this is like your application textbook, your workbook for yeah, exactly. for your own for your own benefit and for your own application daily practice. Yeah. So that takes me to why is this book important? And you already told us that it's like a textbook. 
for yeah. for beginner beginner Zen Buddhists. Well, uh, but well, also, I think it, you mentioned earlier in our previous conversation was that this book is so important because for the first time, um, Zen Buddhism was brought to the West. Yeah, in no, a there book lots, form. Yeah, there were lots of yeah. books, but like. If you don't have access to a monastery or you don't have access to a Zen master, how would you go about starting this? And you can read books on Buddhism, but they don't tell you what to do. They don't tell you mm -hmm. how to go about it. Really, they'll just be saying, if you've read this, you have an understanding of the idea. And if you like the idea, then go get yourself along to a, a monastery. Well, yeah. Zen Buddhism's in Japan. It's like, I've got to drop everything and head off to Japan. Now, Maybe that in the it's, it's a good idea, though. I've seen pictures and videos of these Zen monasteries, and they're so beautiful. And there's nothing extra. You look at them, and it seems like that's it. This is how the whole planet should look like. <laughs> there's no no excess. It's all beautifully with these uh, Zen gardens. You know, the, the with the rakes where they have these paths where they've done trails. Oh, it's amazing. But, yeah, this book gives you a chance to, you know, you're, you're probably, unless you're something like the Buddha, <laughs> you're probably going to struggle to become a massive Zen master. But, like, this might take 10 years. Yeah. But, like, there's, if no, I, there's, there's no race. If after 10 years you're completely at peace, you're serene, you're just enjoying your, your life without anxiety and able to yeah just 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 happy about everything mm -hmm. wouldn't wouldn't that be worth the investment you know like that's all i'm saying it's like let's say you get halfway well isn't that okay so <laughs> yeah <laughs> but by the way we have the link for the book um in the description so if you wanted to go and get it for yourself uh, we've got a link for it where you can buy it but um anyway let's carry on how easy is it to read? I know this is like how long is a piece of string, that kind of question, but do you well, find it do you find it easy to read? Can I actually sit down and read it? Look, it's, I haven't not, read it. it's not complex. It's not a complex book. It's not filled with terminology. But like it, 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 like I, I've been stuck on like four pages for like a week. Why? Well, because inside those four pages is something I need to find out. I mean, this is about the fourth time I've read it, by the way. But it's every time mm -hmm. you read it, you learn more. And the reason for that is that you're different to the way you were for yeah, the fourth time. You're different. So you learn something new every time. And like, what happens if you go deeper into yourself? And therefore, it takes longer because each word almost like becomes important. Why have they used that word? I mean, I'm an anal analyzing a sentence and saying you could interpret this sentence in three ways, and depending on you, that interpretation changes, obviously. Or it could be that there's an interpretation you mm -hmm. haven't yet other. So, how is it difficult to read? No, but if you read it with the intent of learning and improving yourself you know then i would say that you know 10 you, you know you need to read you, you know well, it's just a book you have there and you read it constantly almost it's like mm -hmm, like your your manual yeah so you mentioned some of these words already uh you mentioned session i don't know whether you mentioned uh dokusan and roshi so maybe you can tell us well let's go through all of them what's dokusan well Basically, if you're... Did I spell it right, actually? I, I probably, yeah. I think session is just, it's just my pronunciation that you copied there. But anyway, so, <laughs> so, so basically, these things are what you would find in a monastery. Mm -hmm. um, and there's another one, which, which is obviously um, Kensho. I'll put that one in as well. Which is Enlightenment. Um, now... Dokusan, you miss out. If you're reading this book, these are things you miss out on because session is basically where you have a large number of people in a monastery working together for a week towards enlightenment. Right? To, 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 they're working on, on getting enlightenment, Kensho. And basically, you get the benefit of group, group 
co co um, participation. Now, you don't get that if you're working on your own. It requires you to every day do what you're going to do without any, if you like, getting wrapped up in the whole the whole mood of it and you kind of just get swept along. Like, you don't have that if you're doing it on your own. Um, the other thing you have is you have a Roshi, and a Roshi is a, is a master. Basically, a master who has been approved by a previous master that they've attained the level where they can be called a Roshi and they can teach others. You don't have access to that on your own. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's where they, and they don't tell you how to do it. They just help you with your understanding of things. Or well, they don't give you the answer. They never give you the answer. <laughs> like, there's these, like, uh, things like, what's the sound of one hand? Well, it's like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> but that's for you to consider and ponder until you can demonstrate to the Roshi that you've understood what it means. It's called a cone, K-O-A-N. And when you've explained or demonstrated your understanding of it, they will either say, yeah, you've got to give you another one. Or they'll say, no. Now, there's no. one for you guys. What is the sound of one hand? You and can write in the comments. There's <laughs> another one, which is, I have no idea. <laughs> There's another one, which is, what was your face before your parents were born? What was what was your face before your parents were born? <laughs> Write in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> That's another one. And, you know, right? There's loads of them. There's like 50 of them or something. And, uh, and, uh, Mu, M U is another one. There's a there's a cone called Mu. It's probably the first one in the what they call the Mamu can, which is the this which is the book which contains all of them. Yeah, and uh, um, you know, and unless you've got a Roshi there, kind of like keeping you on track, you could go off on a tangent and not and not get there. So, a Dokusan is the name given to the, everybody that's at the session. If you like, there's there could be fifty. They all get three minutes two or three times a day with the with the Roshi to ask questions. And it's like, it's not... Like a private session, like a one-to-one -one tuition with and the then, Roshi. And in this, in this book, what's nice about this book is that there are 10 students that is basically written the question, the things that they've asked in Dokusan with the Roshi, and it's basically documented those with the approval of the Roshi, but none of them give you answers. They're just giving you the kind of questions that people have asked who've okay. been on a session and what kind of questions they asked the Roshi. So what, were, could the, what questions do people ask the Roshi? So this is the other way around. So... The people asked the question and Roshi gave an answer. Like, for example, oh, why was... But I they was... don't give answers, do they? Well, they, well, they might know. What happens is, is they might say something like, oh, I was, re I was doing in, um, I was doing my... Completely Zazu. irrelevant to what they're asking. Yeah, might say, I was doing... My... No, no, it's, it's to do with it. I was doing Zazen and suddenly the whole room went black and I had this deep, I had this feeling in my stomach that, the, the uh, that was this that or whatever you know mm -hmm. to say what does this mean and the Roshi will turn around and say well, it doesn't mean anything just keep focusing on on your zazen you know like this is not oh that was a good answer I thought they would give something like cryptic <laughs> no they just say it's, it's, it's what they call uh, macchio which is basically the mind playing tricks with you like mm. making you feel like you're important and you've got this special thing going on and it's just a delusion. Just yeah. forget it and get on with it, what you're doing. <laughs> it's a distract, distraction. Yes. So, um, a session was where they all um, yeah, no, go together yeah. and have a workshop and Kensho is the, the stage of enlightenment. Where you've got enlightenment, where you've demonstrated yeah. So the, the, he'll ask you maybe eight questions or ten questions or something, and when you've demonstrated that your your understanding of enlightenment is such that you can answer those questions both swiftly and easily, he will then say you've, you you basically confirm that you've had an enlightenment experience. Mm -hmm. to show you. And we I left this for last. I didn't give it a number um, because it seems to be in the league of its own, Mu. Yeah, well, basically, <laughs> basically, 
what it was was a story about because all of these cones are small stories really so this is like joshua was asked by a monk in all seriousness and this is how it goes has a dog got to uh, oh, by the way joshi is some person it's not another terminology it's just the name of a of a Joshua guy is a, is a well celebrated old uh grandmaster so a like joshi is a, a joshi not, is a joshu is his name a joshu a joshu so is some mm -hmm. and uh he was asked in all seriousness by a monk does a dog have Buddha nature? And um, um, to which the Joshua replied, Mu, <laughs> which is basically Japanese for no, nothing, not at all. But the, he wasn't saying no, he was saying the question's drivel. The question demonstrates you have no idea what you're talking about. Well, because stupid question although because, there are no stupid questions yeah, because because a dog is effectively of nature probably you know you have to do your own research on this um, <laughs> <laughs> don't take but, my word for it <laughs> no, but, but like you couldn't you don't have it or not have it it, it is like almost it is the, the mm. answer so, and it forms the basis of like, study this and try and understand what Joshua meant by it. What did he mean by no, no or not at all, or nothing? It's like, because mostly these cones aren't asking you to answer the question. They're asking you to demonstrate your understanding of enlightenment. So for example, there's another cone which says, there's a boat in the distance. How can you stop the boat from where you are? Mm, write in the comments. How right. can you stop so, the boat from where so you are when it's in the distance? And it's not like, oh, I've got a, some kind of laser beam. And I just... <laughs> it's not like problem solving, no. It's not like... <laughs> Let's stop the boat. That's the, the, that's the objective. I'm going to throw Let's a stop hand the boat. I'm going to throw a hand grenade. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you have to demonstrate your understanding of what this is all about by answering that question and the and the roshi will will interpret what you've said and basically say well you're on the right track or you're not on the right track right well thank you chris are there any other things we missed we probably missed a lot because it's quite a quite a volume yeah i mean uh, yeah, pages it, Yes, an introduction. Mm. It's yeah. I'm not. I'm not saying you have to, there, that there's anything to be done here. It's just an explanation, and people will say, "Oh, I don't agree with it or whatever," and that's fine. Oh yeah, well that's fine. We're well, just well, giving yeah. you um, a book review of the Three Pillars of Zen because somebody might be curious about what it is. And again, if you want to read it for yourself and start maybe understanding, if you're kind of curious. And sometimes curiosity is like with the story of the finding of the ox. Curiosity is all you need to start on a on a completely different path. And so we have the links for either the paperback, like Chris um, is showing you the paperback that's fallen apart in his in his fifth yes. reading. Well, yeah, five, the fifth, five the fifth reads, round. Five reads in, and we've got a. a we need some here. cellar tape for you, yeah, and. Right. And then there's also the um, a link for the Kindle version, um, if you would rather put it on your electronic device, or yeah, if you if you don't want to be actually carrying a book with yourself around, because I mean, Chris just, Chris carries this around everywhere, and it's quite heavy. <laughs> I mean, just as a just as an aside, you know, how did I get to this? Well, you know, I, I used to. I used to serve in the church, you know, like a, in you know, nearby. So I had a, an interest in uh, well, and my my goal there was to go along and learn as much as I could and get involved in order for me to assess whether I thought this was something I wanted to take, if you like, to imbibe into my life, as it were. And I came to the conclusion that, as it was, I didn't you know, I didn't want to be told. And yeah, you know, like you have to do this, you have to do, yeah, you know, like not not that you have to, but it's it's kind of inferred that you should. 
should do some things. And um, I always had a kind of, I, I, I was a kind of Buddhist sympathizer, right? But I've never been to, uh, to, I've been to one Buddhist meeting and I wasn't really that enamored with it either. I'd rather do the thinking on my own kind of thing, which is why I kind of got into this book because it gave me the capability and the inst inst just to outline instructions, mm -hmm. how you go about it, not what to do, how you go about it. And that's why I like it because that's the kind of person I am. It appeals to me as a person. I don't want the solution. I want the ingredients and I'll bake the cake. Mm -hmm. And if I don't like it quite, I'll add a bit of this and change this and, and, and I'll end up with a cake I like. <laughs> so that's kind of how it came about. Okay. Great. Thank you Thank for you watching. For watching. And I hope you really found this useful. Um, don't forget to like, if, or pr press the like button, subscribe, and hit the bell as well. So you're notified when we do the next one. They're, by the way, daily. So um, even if you didn't do that, uh, bell um you can come and check daily what new content we've we've put on the channel some of our videos are actually not on youtube they are in a patreon page which is exclusive you can't see the content that is um on patreon anywhere else so um what else share if you like if you like if you found it useful maybe your friends will find this video useful as well so share it and um the link for the book is in the comment thank you chris okay thank you and thank you for watching guys till next time bye bye